welcome to another episode of Hate Read. I'm Em. And I'm Anna. And every fortnight, one of us challenges the other to read a book that we think that they will hate. So this fortnight, I challenged Em to read Frozen by Melissa De La Cruz. <laughs> Sorry. And some other guy named Michael. Michael Johnston. Um, so, Merc- Michael Johnston, yes, we will properly credit the authors who wrote this book. Um, so, first things first, Em, did you actually finish the book this fortnight? I did finish. Um, it was a pretty quick read. I read it in about three hours this morning. Uh, so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, I, I did get through it. And I don't think I hated it as much as some of the other stuff we've read in terms of, like, the actual reading it was enjoyable and it was uh not something where i felt like i was screaming at the characters every two minutes because they were being so non-human but it wasn't a good book (laughs) yeah no no i think yeah i wasn't screaming at the characters but that was just because i didn't care like they were so boring yeah i just didn't care yeah and I, I felt going into it that I might actually like this book, which is why I was like, last week when you challenged me this, I was kind of like, Anna, what are you thinking? Mm-hmm. This is right up my alley. This is dystopian sci-fi teen lit. Like, I'm into this. I'm on board. Let's go. <laughs> I was like, Anna, you have you have shot yourself in the foot here, my friend. But no, yes, it was... I'm very much the opposite of that. <laughs> it was pretty um, atrocious at times. Uh not in terms yeah. of, like, quality of writing or anything like that. So, like, more than in a lot of cases, I kind of want to preface this with there very well might be people who like this book and think it's great. And mm-hmm. if we start talking about this is this and this seems like your cup of tea, I 100% uh, support you stopping this podcast and going out and reading this book first before you come back. But uh, mm-hmm. it was just – there was so much stuff that I was – I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't know where this is going. I don't know why we're throwing 18 things in this story when we really only need yes. one. Ugh, it was it was a little exhausting. for And for yeah. such a short book, it shouldn't have been that exhausting. Yeah, I think that was my issue with it too, was it just got bogged down with all of this world building that didn't fit in with each other. And yeah. the char- yeah, like I said, the characters were just really kind of dull and and it's and it is this predictable y a trilogy first book of the series, like you kind of right. know what's gonna happen as it happens, uh, but you know if you are not a huge y a reader or if you like sci fi dystopia, like I'm said, check it out, but you know maybe from the library instead of buying it, <laughs> <laughs> so shady uh. <laughs> All right. Well, with all that kind of said, I guess we kind of have to talk about what actually happens in this book. Uh, I don't really mm-hmm. want to because I didn't care at all about what happened in this book. But um... <laughs> Well, and it was so much, too, because YA books are just like plot, 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 plot. So like for us to go over every single plot point, you might as well just read the right. books. We'll be here for three hours. <laughs> right. So we're going to do our best, guys. We're going to do our best. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so this book, <sighs> it starts off with this girl who's in an institution of some sort and she escapes that institution. And that's like the little prologue chapter. And she has a voice in her head, which talks to her and it's monstrous and she's scared of it and what it tells her to do. But like, she still kind of does what it commands her to do. Uh, So Mm -hmm. she gets out of the institution and then we get into the main part of the book, which is this Girl is now working in this city called New Vegas, which is former Las Vegas, and still and has... And not to be confused with the Fallout game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't think like the that same this title. <laughs> anything good. Um, but she is a blackjack dealer in New Vegas, and her name is Nat, and she is working at this casino, and she sees this guy who's called Old Joe, and (laughs) he's very old, which for this book is like 50, because everyone dies very young, which is another thing that I kind of have learned to hate in YA fiction, Mm. is that Mm -hmm. 
I mean, like, I get that it's YA and that the main characters are going to be teenagers, but in a lot of these books, everyone is a teenager in situations where yeah. there should be some adults present. Like, everybody in this book, <laughs> you no need some one supervision. is over 19. Not even that they need supervision, but they're in these situations. Like, she's a blackjack dealer. The main guy is, like, a underworld gang leader and... A mercenary. A mercenary, yeah. And they are both 16 and everyone around them, no one is older than 19. And I'm like, okay, yeah, people die young in this world, but like, couldn't you have a couple 20 year olds in there? Like, it's so bizarre that they're in these situations, which would be adult situations, but there seem to be no adults around. It's so weird. And that's like a kind of recurring thing in YA that if there's like a gang of plucky youths, they're all going to be teenagers. They're all going to be 14 to 19. Uh, There's not going to be one mama bear character who's like 27 or something like that, you know? And it's, it's weird to me. I don't get it. Though, to be honest, like as, as someone in their upper twenties, I would not want to hang out with all those teenagers. Oh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't (laughs) want to hang out with them, but I just don't understand how in this post-apocalyptic world, there are no, because there are books where that's explained like, oh, all of the adults have died or something like that. There are adults that Mm -hmm. exist and are procreating in this world, but none of the, like, I guess that one villain at the end is an adult, but the other one is 19 or something stupid like that. I don't know. There's just every, like the, they're all the soldiers are 14. It's insane. Oh, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and then the weird thing about this book too is like, and I already know we're going to be talking about this for forever now. <laughs> yeah, we're not. We haven't you guys aren't going to get into the plot at all. Sorry. <laughs> um, like this book sets up the world building, but it doesn't. It doesn't mention the fact that everyone is a teenager yet. It just throws out this line: "The fifteen-year-old bride was the one who had asked for another." And I was right. like, "Wait, right. what?" Right. <laughs> right. Well, even the idea that she is a blackjack dealer and she is sixteen is mm-hmm. it's too. It's too immersive in this land of children <laughs> too fast. And it doesn't... Like, again, there are adults in this world. They just aren't on this the page. I don't understand. It's really weird. Yeah. yeah, like, someone has to be in charge of these army boys. Right, right. Like, where is the pit boss? How old is he? Is he eight? He's probably eight. <laughs> but a very so, old eight. <laughs> an, an ancient eight. Mature for his, his years. For his eight. So Nat meets up with old Joe and she, the voice in her head tells her that she should ask old Joe for this stone that he keeps around his neck and is supposedly this map, which will let them find the blue. So she does and old Joe just zombified gives it to her. doesn't question it, which made me think Mm -hmm. that she had mind control powers because, okay, so this is so Difficult to talk about because there's it, so much world building and none yes, of it and matters, it, but it, we have to talk about it because otherwise it won't make sense. Yes. Yeah. It's one of those frustrating books to describe. So they're in this world that is some years in the future and everything is frozen, hence the title. And there are people uh, with these mage marks that allow them to use magical abilities. And Nat is one of these people and... Uh, if you have mage marks, your eyes are a certain color or various. Bright... They're not gray. Yeah, they're various they're bright colors. colors instead of gray and black. Um, so Nat gets by by having contact lenses that change her eye color. Uh, mm-hmm. So she's Legit. hiding the fact that she has these mage marks. And they say like the mage marks give you different abilities like mind reading or whatever or telekinesis. Mm hmm. So I assumed that her thing was going to be mind control after this incident with Joe because he just gives Mm -hmm. it to her with no questions asked. But then that's that doesn't really seem to come up again at any other point in the book. No, she seems to have every single stupid power in the whole thing, like which at the end we find out. Yeah, well, we find out what it really is at the end of the book, which is like, I don't know if it's just because she is that special thing that we'll talk about soon, she gets all the other powers, or if this is total inconsistency. Right, because we find out that her mage mark is, 
like a fire thing and that her power is fire and that she burns things. Mm -hmm. But she seems to have, as the plot demands, telekinesis and mind control Mm -hmm. and precognition. And it's just every single power. The ability to bring people back from the dead. Yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) <laughs> but that was was uh, th- was that her power or was that the power of love? Because I think that was a separate thing. That was the Ugh. power of love. I'm pretty sure. Which, mm, mm, that's a whole topic. That's a whole episode of a podcast. The power of love. <laughs> um, okay, so we've gotten like five percent of the way through this book. Um, so she gets the, <laughs> the she gets the magical stone from Old Joe. And old Joe is instantly, the next night, he's killed in his apartment by people who presumably were looking for this stone. Um, Mm -hmm. So she knows, she's pretty sure it's legit. She kind of, like, looks through it and sees uh, directions, I guess, to this place called The Blue, which is supposed to be this magical land that isn't frozen like everything else. So, okay, in the meantime, there... (laughs) In the meantime, there is a gang of uh, mercenaries led by Ryan Wesson, or Wesson or Wes, depending, which that's just too many. You got too many names, kid. (laughs) Keep it to one, please. (laughs) So they've got uh, Wes or Wesson, who's the leader. And then there's Shakes, who is his former army buddy, who seems to have a... Current BFF. Yeah, current BFF, who has... Seems to have a disease called frost blight, which through almost this entire book, I misread as frostbite and just thought Me they too. were. Me yes. too. <laughs> I was like, frostbite? That's not that big of a deal. Why are they all freaking out about it? Yeah. Um, Why are it, their it, hands not turning black? <laughs> right. I was so confused. I was like, yeah, I guess everybody would have frostbite. But no, it's something called frost blight. But we actually find out way later in the book, he doesn't have frost blight. He's actually epileptic because his mom dropped him on his head when he was a baby in a kerfuffle because the government would, was trying to take him away from them because he was a second child and those are semi-illegal. Which gets into mm. another issue I had with this book, which is <laughs> the amounts of sad backstory that everyone had. Oh. Uh. Which, like, I get it. It's a dystopia. It's going to be pretty depressing. But can we, Mm -hmm. can we institute a new rule for writers? You're allowed to give people one, one sad backstory. That's it. One. Mm -hmm. You don't need them to have been dropped on their head as a child. So they're now epileptic. And then they had to join the army. And then their dad kind of hates them. Like, it's too much. It's And they went bankrupt. Oh, because and of they it. went bankrupt. Like, it's too much. Just calm down and focus yeah. on the one thing. Because uh, And it's yeah. not just Shakes who has that issue. It's all of them. Yeah, Nat has that issue. Wes has that issue. Um, it, it's like she tried to characterize everyone by their background yeah. and what had happened to them. But really what it just amounts to is everyone gets the characteristic of sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not interesting. So, okay. No. We've got Shakes and then we've got Farouk, who is, his personality trait is he's the youngest. That's pretty much yeah. it. He's yeah. He's just, he's just kind of there. And then. He can do everything but master nothing kind of deal. Right. Yes. And then um, the two brothers, whose names I don't remember. and I think they were the Slain brothers, and Darren and... Zedric? Zedric, maybe? Zedric, I think Darren that and was... Zedric? Yeah. yeah. So Darren and Zedric, uh, the two brothers who are collectively the pissy ones, who just yeah. complain about everything. And mm-hmm. Darren a little bit more so, but Zedric is definitely up there as well. Mm-hmm. They run various uh, cons throughout the city, trying to get money and things like that. Sometimes uh, Wes participates in death races, which is some form of racing with, I don't, I don't care, whatever. They run a con where they try to steal money from Nat's casino, and it happens to be on Nat's table. Uh, And... In the process of this con, which wouldn't work in real life for various reasons, Nat ends up stealing the money that they were going to steal. So she ends up with 20,000 heat credits, 
which is a lot of heat credits, I guess, and worth many things. Yeah, we have, we are not given any context as to how much that is. Just, just many. It's worth many. She decides that with this newfound windfall, she is going to hire smugglers to get her out of the city so that she can try to go find the blue because people with mage marks are like hunted down and rounded up and put into Mm -hmm. presumably institutions like the one that we saw at the beginning with her when she escaped. Yes. So she finds some people to hire and she hires this gang of ragtag ragamuffins and surprise it's the guys that were at her table a few nights ago who tried to pull that con and are the reason that she has the money in the first place. And then the Mm -hmm. rest of the story is them going on an adventure to try to get to the blue and facing various obstacles and overcoming those obstacles and, and falling in love and falling in love uh, and pairing off in obnoxious. Well, we'll get, not going to. So yeah, and falling in love. Um, <laughs> so they go through the desert, the trash desert that exists <laughs> in between Las Vegas and California. <laughs> it really is though. It's a trash desert. It's That's just it piles is. of garbage. It was described as like, I guess instead of doing anything with the garbage in this post-apocalyptic wasteland, they've just been throwing it over the fence <laughs> um, of New Vegas, literally just throwing it over the fence for a hundred years <laughs> and it's become a desert. So yeah, so they, they get through the trash desert and they end up in K-Town, which is the part of Los Angeles that was Koreatown, I think. Yeah. And they go to a, or they have, um, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking how stupid the next plot point is. They have Nat... <laughs> Go to a poker game against. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about this. They have not go to a poker game against um this guy who also has eighteen million nicknames, but we're gonna go with the slob because it's the funniest one. Mm-hmm. So up against the slob who currently has possession of Wes's ship, the Alby, because mm-hmm. I guess he he won it from him in a poker game. Probably, I guess I don't know. That's what it sounded like. Yeah. So they. Put Nat, they have Nat go and challenge him to a poker game. They're playing poker and she, she, she pulls out this bag of salt, which we have not heard anything about this up until this point. Oh, yeah. But suddenly she has it this bag of salt convenient. that she stole from the institution. Uh, and salt is worth so, so, so much money because all of the sea salt now is gross and polluted. So good salt is worth a ton mm-hmm. of money. Wait, so what happens next is just... Uh, essentially, it's the... <laughs> it's just so dumb. <laughs> okay. It's the classic, she wagers something worth a lot to him. So to get him to wager something that she wants, and then they play mm-hmm. poker, and then she wins sort of setup very basic normal thing but the way that this unfolds in this case first off she wagers the salt and he seemingly does not agree to wager anything at this point he has not agreed to wager the boat nothing and they play their hand out and she loses so she loses the salt. Purposefully. She loses the salt, which, what was she wagering against? Nothing. And then he's like, uh huh, huh. I've been lulled into a false sense of security, so now I'm going to wager the boat. What are you wagering against it against? her nothing. Nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do, do they not understand how wagers work? <laughs> so no, that, absolutely not. That is stupid enough. But then... Then Nat, in her little internal monologue, is like, Nat had been counting the cards, so she knew that a winning hand was coming up for her. That's you. That's not how poker works. You can't. What are you talking about? <laughs> counting the cards, honey. Like I feel like they these shuffle offers, them every time, don't they, Em? <laughs> yes. Yes, you're not playing with eight decks. What are you? It's one deck. What are you talking about? So. This whole book, I feel like the authors had seen like Ocean's Eleven or something and kept referencing 
casino stuff that they saw and were like, oh, I can make up a reason for why they do that. Or, oh, I think I get how that game works. And then they Mm -hmm. realized that they didn't have to do any further research because their target audience is not legally allowed in a casino. (laughs) So no one was going to call them on their bullshit. But there's so much bullshit in this book, you guys. There's one point... Um, I should mention, I know this because I work in a casino. Um, yes, <laughs> we've got insider knowledge here. Like I've worked, I've worked in the uh, casino industry for half a decade. So, and to be fair, I've never worked in Vegas. So perhaps things are completely different out there. But uh, at one especially point, in New Vegas, right? At, so I just I have to talk about this con at the beginning where they're playing blackjack, and the con that they set up is. It's a two-man con. So they've got Wes and they've got Darren. I think it's Darren or is it Shakes? Mm, I I honestly... Who cares? They were all the same. They've got Wes and Ragamuffin. One... (laughs) the, The plan is that at some point in the game, Ragamuffin will switch out his... Well, Wes will distract the dealer, which in this case is Nat. Ragamuffin will switch Mm -hmm. out his bad card for an ace. So it'll make a king and an ace or a ten and an ace, whatever, beating the dealer. Then when the dealer looks and gets suspicious, Wes will steal the chips that are in play. So there's Mm -hmm. a few things wrong with this. (laughs) Number one, for the chips to be in play, they must have had the chips at some point. Which means they didn't yeah. need to do any of this. They just had the chips. Why? What does? What is this accomplishing? So did they? Yeah. Did they? Why ha- did they just walk away with why their did winnings? They just steal the chips. I don't understand because they weren't trying to get her to pay the chips. So I think supposedly what happens is that the ragamuffin reaches into the tray while she's distracted, puts the chips up, and then takes his mm-hmm. like less good chips, like his dollar chips or whatever, down. But there's absolutely no way that would ever happen in a million years. That's like almost physically impossible for something that ridiculously over the top to happen in a casino with cameras. <laughs> so already stupid premise. But then in addition, so when they switch out the cards, so he has an ace and a king 21. That, okay, when you, I'm so sorry for all of our listeners who do not care about this, but <laughs> we're very passionate when, about these kinds of small details here on hate read <laughs> when you're dealing blackjack the first thing you do is p- pay any blackjacks before you flip over your cards and do whatever like you check to make sure you don't mm-hmm. have a blackjack which she didn't but then you mm-hmm. pay the blackjack first so it wouldn't have been sitting out there for it sh- if someone okay i'm trying <laughs> to describe this okay so if i'm sitting there dealing and I'm like, da 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 da, talking to some other guy, and I look back, and someone has an ace king. I'm not gonna be like, huh, that's weird. That guy didn't have that before. I'm gonna be like, no, that guy didn't have that before. Security, come over here and kick this cheater out. I would at <laughs> no point be confused the way that is, because that's not how the game works. <laughs> It was so frustrating. And I'm just like, cool, I get it. You've never been in a a casino. That's fine. But maybe don't write about it then. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of things you can Google or, you know, like even take a trip to a casino to see how this book that you're getting published should be written. Yeah. So, okay. So back to (laughs) what's happening. So they, they pull off this second stupid con. Oh, except actually, even though she counted the cards, she realizes she's gonna, she gets like a flash of intuition that he's pulled a better hand than her. So Mm -hmm. she uses her magic powers to make a wind, which she never does intentionally. She never like, is like, I'm going to do this. It's just magic happens. Uh So it makes a wind. And again, this is a different power than she's used before. Right, 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 right. Uh, So like a wind comes through and like disrupts the cards. Which, again, in any casino or, like, back room poker game or, like, a poker game at your house, if the cards get messed Mm -hmm. up, that's a dead hand. You're going to stop and reshuffle the cards and start the hand over. You're not just going to be like, oh, well, this magical wind came by and flipped these cards around, so I guess I'll just keep going. Like, that's not... Whoops! So that was... And the authors even make a note of saying, like, and Slob didn't seem to care at all. Like, right. well, he what? probably should have. 
You probably should have, because that seems like a pretty big... Also, they're not outside, so what did he think this magical wind was? <laughs> Someone just sneezed really hard, okay? Right. <laughs> yeah, and especially in a world where, like, you're they're in K-Town, and K-Town is accepted as this place where marked individuals can go free, where they can't... Right. In other areas. So, like, if you know that there are people, if there are individuals in this world that are allowed to be free, that can manipulate objects in their vicinity, and you see something magically manipulated, why are you not like, hey, we need to look at this? (laughs) So, Slav is clearly an idiot. Doesn't he have, like, a slave who's also a magician who looks at her suspiciously but doesn't do anything? Uh, they get the boat back from Slob, and they go on a lovely boating adventure. Oh, and there are zombies. I probably should have mentioned that at some point. No, wait. (laughs) Not zombies. zombies. They are these monsters called thrillers, (laughs) which, guess what, are named after Michael Jackson's hit song, Thriller, (laughs) because of the way they move their arms. (laughs) LOL. is hysterical <laughs> but raises a lot of questions as to what remnants of the past have been yeah uh continued into this world because they talk a lot about how they don't have books anymore and they only have writing that's practically hieroglyphics except it's not at all because it's still letters it's just writing without vowels yeah uh, it's textilish which yeah is basically right. how an eight-year-old would text I don't, I don't even know. I mean, with autocorrect, people people don't even text that way anymore. Like, No. I mean, like, people texted that way in the early 2000s, I guess, when you didn't have smartphones and you had to press the keys. Yeah, you when know, you only had to, that like, letters. T9 or whatever it was called. Yes, yes. Yes, T9. Um, yeah, but that, I, I guess 2009, that's when this, I think this was written in, or published in 2009, so I guess that was kind of just on the way out so people were still making a big deal about people texting in short you know yeah abbreviations and whatever i just i just love the idea though that there are some people in this world that just like talk that way yes (laughs) because they 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 make mention of like this gross guttural language and it takes the characters a moment but they're speaking in textlish right and they very specifically say earlier in the book that this is supposed to be like egyptian hieroglyphics which are Mm -hmm. not something you can pronounce so it just it makes no yeah which now i'm thinking about it were they talking about emoji (laughs) was it like i think people were going around like eggplant emoji question mark (laughs) no no i don't think it was emojis i think because they it the one because they're talking about how there are no books except for things that are written in textlish, and uh-huh. the the example they give is like she didn't want to sit around reading five consonants less than three four consonants. So it's yeah. some love story about two people. So I think the heart is supposed to be like oh, uh... which makes me think that these people who are speaking textlish are going less than three. <laughs> Hold on. No, wait. They we have to be. stop they... the podcast here and then resume once we only can speak in textlish. <laughs> Burb. <laughs> Lamau. <laughs> a ruffle. Oh, wait. No, sorry. That had a vowel in it. <laughs> <laughs> so does Lamau. Oh, that's true. Shit. What are vowels? What are vowels? I don't know. What are consonants? What are words? <laughs> Who knows? What is anything? <laughs> so, oh God, where even were we? Okay, so, so they get the ship. They get the ship. There's some zombies, which they find. They then realize, or Nat then realizes, that the zombies are people with the mage marks, and they are rotting from the inside because of the mage marks to the point where they are still conscious, but mm-hmm. can't really do anything. I mean, they... I did, they're just gross. Like, essentially, they're just gross because they're so conscious and they can still walk around. I guess they can't talk, but they, I think it's No, just they could talk gross. a little bit because they were saying, like, help oh, me, yeah. help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, so I just... was just imagining, like, old Greg, you know, kind of like just someone kind of who looks green <laughs> and covered in a little bit of seaweed, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> but also Michael Jackson's Thriller. Oh yeah, but, but also doing because that that's dance. that's how they move. Which again, yeah. okay, so that was my original. That was my original point with the whole textless thing. Like, um, so we know that books don't exist really in this world, but Michael Jackson's Thriller does. And yeah. They keep referencing this stuff, and this is the other thing. Anytime something is set, however many years in the future, and you still reference culture from you know the last fifty years or whatever, the problem with that is that that implies that either the disaster happens like tomorrow from our mm-hmm. perspective, or just no one did anything for a hundred years. That would be <laughs> something people would reference. <laughs> is it like is thriller to them? Like how uh, a Yankee Doodle would be to us. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> like, like that this old, old folk tune thriller. Right, right. They're sitting there on their banjos. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only sing it around the 4th of July or like Memorial Day, really. <laughs> uh, maybe on Halloween, I guess it's a, it's, it's pretty I was gonna uh, say topical Halloween, then probably. as well. Yeah. But, oh, man. Yeah. So the... Th- the thrillers try to get on the ship and Nat realizes this whole thing about the mage marks, but they get away and they sail off into the sea. And then there's some more boring travel stuff, but... But trash birds. The big point is that... <laughs> right, trash birds. Yeah, so not only was trash desert not enough... It's trash, but... trash ocean. But yeah, they are, they are now in trash ocean. And the water's black? Which... Yeah, and I think poisonous? Yes, yeah. it's diseased they're very sure that nothing can live in the ocean but then they see some fish and then they see this bird and then darren shoots the bird and this makes the (laughs) this kind of kicks off like literally darren shooting the bird darren shooting the bird is what kicks off like the second half of the book unintentionally so darren shoots this bird and unbeknownst to anybody the bird was the messenger of this creature, which at the moment, what is it referred to? The the, the whaler. The whaler. The whaler. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So there's this thing called the whaler, and we find out later the bird was its messenger, and that's why it's so mad at Darren. But it keeps trying to fuck up their ship, and then mm-hmm. they run into a trash burg, and then everything seems grim, but then it's not because they have sails because of course they do and then they continue on their merry way and then they run into another ship that has been attacked and there are some some survivors that call for help and they let them on their ship and Wes decides to jump on over to the other ship to see if there are any other survivors but then Mm -hmm. while he's over there Darren decides, fuck this guy. (laughs) And won't throw him the rope to come back. So he just starts going down with the ship. And he's like, no, Darren, how could you? (laughs) Oh, and and prior to this, Darren had figured out that Nat was magical and wanted to kill her. But then she burned him because she has all the powers. He got an ouchie, Uh, so so now he hates women. Yes, women and Wes. Um, So... (laughs) So Wes is gonna die, but then who rescues him? Nat rescues Nat him. Nat does, because no. he calls out Cause... to her in the ocean. He says, Nat, can you hear me? I'm dying. Help. And Correct. she right, does. Right, right. <laughs> and she does, because they have a special connection. It's love. It's love, but I thought it was incest. And I was like, so I did into that. I was so ready for it to be incest, because I was like, yes, yeah, something to spice this book up, finally. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> because... <laughs> Wes has a twin sister who Mm -hmm. mysteriously disappeared in a fire when they were seven. And my thought was that that was going to be Nat. But because Nat was an orphan and adopted by some lady when she was very young, but then found by the government and and sent to the institution. memories of fire. Right. So I'm like, yes, they're brother and sister. This isn't going to be a boring romance. It's going to be real It's going to be... A weird incest thing, and then she's gonna go run off with um with slob because they're gonna they're gonna mm. do some sort of love triangle thing, and it's gonna be great. But none of that happened. <laughs> no, it was actually not a problem at all because it turns out that Nat just was a person who went and killed 
babies as a small child. And so she thought she killed Eliza, but she did it. It's fine. But she didn't. And Eliza actually was magical and created an, an illusion of fire and then ran away. Mm-hmm. And of course, Wes knew all this and was able to explain it to her immediately. So there was no drama right. or tension at all. There was no drama. And they found out that the real reason that they were connected was because when she ran away from the institution, she ran into the middle of one of his races and protected him from dying, which wasn't brought up at any other point in this book. Oh, gosh, it was just no. kind of thrown in at the end. Yeah. Oh, hey, I remembered why you look so familiar to me. Do you it's remember? It's not because... It's not because you're my long-lost brother. Uh, it's not because we're in this incestuous relationship, but it's because I flew and landed in your race and you stopped your car. Oh, yeah. Thanks, baby. <laughs> oh, I was wondering what happened to you. <laughs> that, was, that was good. I really, I really enjoyed our time together. Yep. And I'm glad well. we're not related. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is all very deep. So she saves Wes and then something... Pops, do they, hold on, They do they throw Darren overboard, or does the... No, the, the whaler comes, grabs it. Okay, the whaler, Darren, the whaler, that's yeah, what I thought. Darren shoots the woman, and, and this is where it, like, introduces the part where you're like, oh, yeah, this is a sci-fi dystopian. Nope, you were wrong. It's actually fantasy. No, this is because definitely fantasy. They the start time. introducing a bunch of, like, elves and fae and small folk and stuff that have magic <laughs> into the book. I really thought the small men were going to be another mini wad situation. Because <laughs> she mentions them at the beginning. Because she does mention all the sylphs and drow uh-huh. and small men at the beginning in like a list. She's like, oh, the frost came and then the sylphs came and the drow and the small men and they were all around. But we're not going to talk about them too much. So mm-hmm. I really thought the small men were going to be another mini wad situation where it's just dropped in with no explanation and then never revisited <laughs> again. Here's something you've never heard of before. <laughs> <laughs> and Enjoy. also has also has a name that people are way more familiar with that you could have used and it would have made way more sense. Gnomes, dwarves, any of those would have been fine. Yeah. But no, we're going to go with small men. Small men. who They were men, but some of them were also women. Which, oh, I was very curious about if there were women because mm-hmm. they kept saying small men. And then the two small men that show up at this point end up being gay together. And... I was like, well, does it count if just you're a one gender race? Is it still being gay or are you just like all one gender? So that's not really a thing. But then it turns out there were small women. So I guess, yeah. yay, representation. They are in fact gay. They ticked off that diversity checkbox. Yep. Yep. They were yep. going down the line. They yeah. were making sure at which A plus. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, for 2009 too, that was pretty, pretty yeah. ahead of the curve. Yeah. <laughs> but, um. Yeah, so I guess, like, Darren's like, ew, look at all these gross non-humans, and he goes to shoot one of them, and as soon as he does, the whaler grabs him off the boat and flings him half a mile into the water. Yeah, and they kind of try to save him, but it doesn't really work, and they decide it's not really worth their own lives. He's meant for death. So they, they can't save him, and his brother is distraught, so they throw him in the brig, because that's the only thing they can think of to do, mm-hmm. and they continue on their journey. A little while later, his brother breaks out of the brig and leaves, like just fucks off on a boat, which I guess they had the whole time. Mm-hmm. I don't know. A lifeboat uh, or something. Yeah, so they just scamper away, and we continue on with this new set of characters. So we've got, we've still got... Wes and Nat and Shakes. And then we have the two small men who are Brandon uh, and Brandon and something. Something with a D, right? No, because they call Brandon Donnie. That's what I'm thinking of. They called Brandon Don. Yeah, they kept calling Brandon Donnie. Because I guess oh, God. Don at the end of Brandon. Brandon. I'm Brandonnie. Um, <laughs> right. So they have Donnie and his boyfriend. <laughs> and yeah. He, he had no part in this except for to be the guy's boyfriend. He literally right. provided, he had, I don't think he had any dialogue. He didn't do no. anything on the ship. He was just there to be no. a boyfriend. Right. Well, so they have the two of them, and then they have the girl Leanne who's a sylph, who, Leanna, Le- and Le- at Le- this Le- Le- point, everybody essentially couples off. So we've got Brandon and his boyfriend, and then Leanna, uh starts hooking up with, <laughs> Uh, shakes 
and then Nat and Wes are kind of in a relationship, sort of. So honestly, if I was Farouk and Zedric, I would have fucked off too, because I don't want to be on this fuck ship anymore. <laughs> like, every- <laughs> like, everybody's over here, partnered up, and I'm just single with this 14-year-old. Like, yeah, I'm going to leave. Like, this is so lame. Yeah. So the fuck ship gets captured by <laughs> a bunch of slavers. Yep, who, like, it turns out they're not really slavers. They're actually working for the government to capture marked people for the government to kill them. Like, it was some weird... I didn't understand it. It was like... I, I think they were slavers who were gonna slave anyway. Because slavers, slavers gotta, gotta slave. slave. <laughs> <laughs> but the government was like, we want you to slave aggressively in this particular area. And they were like, yeah, sure. So if you're going they weren't doing off. anything that they weren't going to be doing anyway. Mm-hmm. The only reason this was introduced was because at the beginning, Wes was offered a job and it turns out this was that job was to go slave mm-hmm. and he turned, and he it, turned down. it down. So whatever, who cares? Um, <laughs> so the slavers capture them mm-hmm. and they get split up into two groups with uh, Donnie and his boyfriend and shakes on one boat. And Nat and Wes and la 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 on the other one. There's so many ends in her name. It's ridiculous. There's so many ends in her name, you guys. At least four. (laughs) Then it's just this really depressing story about being on a slave ship. Except, okay, here's the thing. And this was another issue I had with this book. It kept threatening sexual violence Mm -hmm. in a way that was clearly present but never stated. Mm -hmm. Anytime anything happened to Nat, Wes would be like, oh, they didn't touch you, did they? And she'd be like, oh, I'd never let them touch me. Yeah. And it's very clear what they're saying, but it also never takes that step. And I'm not saying I want it to, because I really Mm -hmm. don't. But why are you bringing it up in the first place, you know? Yeah. Like, why are we... The whole relationship with sex in this book is very, very strange. I was just about to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the STD thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then, like, how they call it marriage, even though it's not being married. They call the act. So I guess, like, if you want to have sex with someone in this universe, you both have to go to, I guess, the county clerk, I don't know, with all of your forms and prove neither of you have STDs, and then you can bang. You have to take a blood test. Yeah, you have to take a blood test, and then you can bang. Which, and then they call that marriage. But there are two types of marriage. One where it's like you're married married, and one where you just bang. Yeah, it was very strange. And also not really a good way to prevent STDs, because I feel like most people are probably just not going to do that, like yeah. any of it. <laughs> what, what's, what's the, the repercussion? incentive to do it that way? Yeah, I mean, like, right. it's behind closed doors. No one... Right, no one's going to know. Yeah, the sex police aren't... <laughs> you know, patrolling everyone's bedrooms every night. Unless, unless they are. Unless, well, yeah, that's true. Unless they that's, are. That's why That's why old Joe really got capped. It wasn't anything to do with this map. It was that he had like a hooker in his room. And <laughs> he they was hadn't, doing it. They hadn't gone through the proper paperwork. He was having non-marital sex. Which... Right. So, so there's all that. And then again, Okay, so that system exists of everybody has to do paperwork to have sex, but then there keeps being these, like, threats of sexual violence, which Mm -hmm. obviously then the paperwork system doesn't work if people are still out here raping people. I mean... Yeah, like, if there are sex slaves... Right, did they take the sex slaves to get their blood work done? Are they sex slaves? Are they... Right, (laughs) So many questions. I feel like the questions that this sets up is so much worse than if you just didn't have any of them. You know, I personally hope that in the the next two books, they go very in-depth into the sex of this universe. (laughs) Yes, because that's really why I'm here. Yeah, that's the only reason I'd keep reading. So, yeah, okay, so there's several scenes of them being on the slave ships and the terrible conditions and blah, blah, blah. And then they eventually mount an insurrection. They get off the slave ships and everybody escapes and everything's all cool. And then it turns out that the government has found, no, Nat gives Slob the stone. The map. Yeah. The map, the map stone. Mm -hmm. Because the voice told her to, which again, it seems like another one of these 
con situations where I was expecting that to be, and maybe I just missed it because I really didn't care at this point. I was, I was like at this point, yeah. expecting that to set something up like, mm-hmm. Okay, so the voice wants the government to go there so it can destroy everything and make everything better, but that doesn't happen. It's just they get the stone and they go to attack the blue, which is actually a portal to a magical fairy world. And Mm -hmm. then Nat, I guess it was to get Nat to have to go and be the Dracon Rider, I think was what it was supposed to be. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, they go to de- the government goes to destroy the magical portal mm-hmm. and Nat finds out that actually she's super special because she the what is that fucking thing called? The whaler, the whaler <laughs> is actually this thing called the Dracon and it's basically not dragon, a dragon guys. so why are, it's right, why are we not just calling it a fucking dragon? Because that's um, what it is. It's a flying being that breathes fire and is like reptilian. <laughs> right. What else would it fucking be? Right, like it's a dragon. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> Dracon. Um, so, <laughs> so the Dracon was created 16 years ago, but because everything is terrible because of the frozenness, it was born in fairy world, but also in the real world. So Nat is its heart in the real world. So Nat has to go ride it in order to save everybody. And they like burn mm-hmm. some shit up and, and it's lovely, and then... All the ships are melted, and then yeah. she, like, washes up on shore, and they're like, all right, well, it's time to close this place up. Just screw all those guys on the outside, because that's why it was open <laughs> in the first place, was because they were like, we have to get our brothers and sisters that were born in this world and bring them back to the blue so we can close close these doors, because it's not really the blue, it's actually... um. Oh, shit. What is it called in King it's Arthur? It's Atlantis slash it, Avalon slash... Avalon, that's what it is. Yeah. Something, some other stupid name that they come up yeah. with. But the thing... So, like, essentially the conceit is that every few thousand years, there's an age of magic that exists. Mm-hmm. And the two worlds become one, and everything's hunky-dory, but then they split. And then... So, we're they're supposed to be at a point where they're going to come back together, but because of all the nonsense with everything being frozen, they can't. So they decide that the best solution world. Yeah. So the best solution is to just close it off for right now while they figure out what to do, which is presumably what the next two books are going to be about. But Nat Mm -hmm. ends up having to stay because she has to stay and protect it with the Dracon and everybody else fucks off to go find people that they can help out in the real world yeah and and which was confusing to me because like so leonin was like leonin was like my only job is to find out what's causing this frost okay but like if you're closing off the blue why do you still need to figure it out like just well i think it was (laughs) try again in a thousand years i think it's not totally closed off it seems like they can maybe open because they say oh we're gonna close off this entrance so i think maybe oh. there are other entrances okay maybe i don't know not fully explained i assume it's in the sequels y'all go read it and find out um, yeah please email us and tell us how this series ends because i'm certainly not reading any whether or not it gets sexy <laughs> yeah let us know if the uh whole west thing turns out that they are actually related because that'd be cool mm-hmm. or if um Slob ends up being the bad boy that she tries to reform because that's a hundred percent where I see oh, this yeah. going. Oh yeah, this could totally pull 100%. a Terra Moffy, shatter me where we start mm-hmm. shipping the yes. main character with yes. the villain. Mm-hmm. Oops, so good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got to a lot of the stuff I kind of wanted to talk about because I feel like I ranted for most of this episode. Yeah, there was. I guess my big thing. Was, and I don't know if, if it was just with my copy or if yours had this too, but we reread the Kindle versions of these books because it's easier yeah. to highlight the things that piss us off. But there there was randomly italicized passages in this book. Yes, yes, I noticed that and I, I took yeah. note of that too. I was very confused. There were times it made sense where it'd be like at the start of a chapter or, you know, when you're doing a flashback, okay, you can use your italics there. But then it would be like at a paragraph break. Right. The text would all of a sudden be italicized and it wasn't like a change in point of view or a change in tense or anything it was just like a continuation of the action and i was like why right i don't know if that's just like something the 
the, it weird that happened in the Kindle edition of this book or what, but I didn't understand yeah, the I, significance I couldn't of figure it out, and I was very confused about it, because some of it made sense because it was italicized because it was the voice in her head, but then mm-hmm. other stuff was not the voice in her head, and it was still italicized, so I don't, I don't know. It was very, very confusing and a mm-hmm. weird choice on whoever was in charge of formatting for this book. Yeah. I had a question. Mm-hmm. When was this supposed to take place? I couldn't tell, and I don't know if there was right? anywhere that they said well, anything about that. I was trying to figure it out, because you know, anytime I'm like, you know how I get where I'm trying to figure out mm-hmm. minutia that doesn't actually matter. But <laughs> um, so okay, so we know that the the timeline of events leading up to this, right? There was culture happening, textlish mm-hmm. happened. At some point after Textlish, the flood happened. Mm -hmm. And then after the flood, everything became frozen at some point. But we don't Mm -hmm. know how much time passes in between those, right? We Mm -hmm. know that Wes says that his dad's dad, his dad's dad's dad used to tell him, tell the next one's stories about California and that California was the first place that got wiped out by the flood. So Mm -hmm. within like four generations was the flood, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. Couldn't have been more than like, especially because everybody was having kids young because they kept saying everyone was having kids at 20 and whatever. Yeah. um, Because everyone was dying. So hundred years, right? Let's say a hundred years since the flood. Mm -hmm. And then the freezing happened some point after that. Okay. Surely that's not a fast process. (laughs) Right, right, right. So let's say like within the last 50 years, everything has become just rock solid frozen, right? Mm -hmm. In that time, are we to believe that polar bears and penguins have taken over the entire planet? (laughs) Because that is what this book is asking me to believe. Polar bear and penguin master races. (laughs) Because, because first off, early in the book at some point, they say, oh, there was nothing there but polar bears and penguins. And I was like, wait, both? Both? Both are there? So <laughs> some sort of... We need more bear representation, please. Like, <laughs> Well, you know, well, they did they did make a lot of references to China. So maybe the panda master race is over there in China. And everyone knows pandas are way no, better you, than polar bears. So. You, you know that those fucking pandas got wiped out no, way early in all this don't natural disaster. That. No, Anna, they can't fuck without human intervention at this point. Like <laughs> they're not surviving a flood. Maybe they maybe they chose that time to grow up and start taking care of themselves a little better. I don't know. Maybe they hundred percent were maybe victims this was of the, this mass extinction. This was the inciting incident that caused pandas to mature. And maybe now they're all successful businessmen over in China. You don't know. The book didn't take us there. Why- Anything could have happened. Um, um, yeah, I was just very, the polar bears kept coming up and I was like, why? Why are there, they, there aren't that many polar bears to have, I, it just. But there were, at this point in the story, there are enough of them for them to be shot and hunted for sport. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just don't think, I don't think that, I mean, I am impressed by Miss De La Cruz's, uh, optimism for the bounce back of the polar bears but they're Mm -hmm. like pretty endangered right now i'm pretty sure they're not doing too well so i don't know i feel like 50 years is not enough time for this species to cover the entire planet like it just yeah well and and like let's be real like probably all of these animals died in the flooding part anyway (laughs) like well, the flood couldn't have gotten too far because it only got to California. It didn't get to oh, Vegas. Yeah, that's true. So it didn't true. destroy it didn't get to Texas. everything. Right, it didn't get to Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, it just got to California and New York, which... Which then again, my, my question is then, so like these characters have never seen animals before in their lives of any kind. They've never right. seen fish. Right. They've never they seen birds. They've never times. seen bears. Well, I've, well, I mean, we've seen polar bears at the zoo, but whatever. But, like... No, they haven't seen polar bears at the zoo because there's a line where no, they specifically we've, we've say... No, we've seen them, I've said. Like, oh, we've oh, seen oh. polar bears at the zoo. I was about to be like, but no, like... they haven't seen polar bears at the zoo. Because <laughs> <laughs> they specifically say in this book, there are no zoos in New Vegas. I'm like, are there currently a ton of zoos yeah. in Las Vegas? Like, are there multiple zoos in Las Vegas? Is that a thing? I don't think so, but maybe. I don't know. But you would think that, like, 
rats would still be a thing or yeah, like cockroaches fennec, fennec foxes or yeah like there, right? surely there's some sort of wildlife that exists in new vegas that people would have seen before I, there, there's no way that this flood could have taken out every single animal especially every scavenging organism. types well i think that at least in new vegas because there's animals outside of new vegas there's the polar bears mm-hmm. and whatever but yeah i guess maybe I don't know. Maybe there's some sort of artificial barrier preventing whatever animals remain from entering mm. New Vegas. I don't know. It was. Come on, there's got to be dogs. Maybe we've got to still have dogs. Setting up a a false animal economy in this world. They're just yeah just hoarding them yeah. all somewhere else so that no one else can have animal companionship. Well, the rich people, and that was the other thing. There were there were class issues in this. But mm-hmm. I felt like they were never really addressed. Or ever really an issue either. Yeah. There was no there was no ruling class. It was all Yeah. It was all poor people and they were all making each other miserable. Like mm-hmm. the military is made up of all of these poor people and they're all self inflicting these traumas onto each other. So yeah. it it was this weird like self oppression, but there clearly are rich people because they talk about oh, the rich people have this and the rich people have that. Or maybe there aren't rich people and it's all just a myth that they're using to self-oppress. I don't know. From a Marxist standpoint, it's fascinating. (laughs) (laughs) That's another thing that I hope that they go to in real depth in the sequel. I would like a, just like a full analysis of this entire economy Mm -hmm. and political system. Yes. Yes, less dragons, more economics, please. Yes, and I I mean really, yes. like, I want the nitty-gritty. Like, do yeah. not hold I back. I need spreadsheets. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So that's, like, that's the book, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty much the book. Did you uh, identify with any of these characters? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you asked. Yes. I I think I identified most with um, the whaler. <laughs> <laughs> most of the book like just moaning in the sea and then <laughs> and then attacks people that annoy them and <laughs> breathes fire at the end i can only hope to be slightly as cool as the wailing dragon dr- dracon the the whaler was definitely the best character in this book the whaler except, did nothing wrong <laughs> except then you would have to put up with nat because she would be uh, forever your heart. Well, maybe I, maybe my heart it belongs to another person, and that's I think we might not have mentioned that is like Nat and the whale, and Nat and the and the dragon <laughs> are soulmates or something. <laughs> How much better would this book be if it was just a whale? I thought it was gonna be. Sky. I thought they'd be like, oh look, they like bastardized the word whale. They got they got the wrong <laughs> one. You failed at the homonym game, guys. <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh. Uh, it was a dragon the whole time. How about you? I kind of identified with Farouk mm. just because I'm trying to find the passage where he's introduced real quick because it's very me. <laughs> oh, here we go. Farouk was 13 going on 30, a blabbermouth. He never stopped talking, even when he didn't have the slightest idea what he was talking about. Like, that's me. I mean, <laughs> I just, <laughs> he was an expert on every topic with no experience to back it up. Me again. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. He he also at the like we mentioned he leaves the boat with Cedric after mm-hmm. after Darren dies, which it turns out that wasn't by choice. He was forced by Cedric to leave. But I totally would have left that boat. I would have been like, I'm over this. This is some dumb bullshit. I'm gonna go <laughs> take my chances in this little rowboat and. Probably die soon, and who cares? Because this is a miserable world, and I want to fuck off out of it. I'm gonna die if I stay here. I'll die if I leave. At I'll least if I chances. leave, I don't have to be around you fuck nuts anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to be around Hormone Central. Right, everybody up in this boat getting busy. <laughs> oh man. Okay, well, it was there. We kind of talked about how it wasn't the worst book. What, what what would you say was your favorite part of this book? Then what was your silver lining? Oh, man. Um, Well, it wasn't the romance because the romance was so boring and Mm -hmm. dry and between two characters who I cared nothing about. And it wasn't really like I was thinking, oh, maybe the representation because they do tick a lot lot of boxes. But 
I don't know. I liked it when it was a sci-fi book before it became a fantasy book. (laughs) (laughs) If they had just stuck with it. Again, there were like a lot of, there were a lot of good ideas Mm -hmm. and potentially a good plot. But then, and I mean, I'm not saying you can't blur the lines between sci-fi and fantasy, but this was just very much, very aggressively set up to be a sci-fi book, and then it suddenly 180'd and was fantasy, and it was just very disconcerting. So yeah, I liked it when it was a sci-fi book before all of the elves and dwarves yeah. that aren't called elves and dwarves show up. Before it got too bogged down in the details. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How about you? Did you have a, a favorite thing from this book? Oh... Um, (laughs) I liked the part where, no, I didn't. I didn't have any. (laughs) It was all garbage. No, it wasn't. Well, I guess that's the thing. Like Much like the landscape surrounding (laughs) New Vegas. It was trash. It was trash. No, I mean, it wasn't great. I think, I guess the silver lining to me was it just kind of like, flat line like it was just even like the whole book it was just like it didn't go down it also didn't go up for me but like you know (laughs) maybe a younger Anna would have really appreciated this before she had read like the 30 other book series that are exactly like this right Uh. and I mean again I am not bothered as much by reading stuff that's been done a million times I I can get into it but this was just it was weird (laughs) it was too much and too many things happening and none of them made sense and none of them made the characters any more interesting I think that was kind of the big thing is just the characters were so boring because if you're gonna have a formulaic Mm -hmm. story it has to be with good characters and I didn't care Mm -hmm. about any of these characters because I mean I can get into formulaic stuff I can get down for some you know police procedurals or whatever yeah, sometimes that's comforting. Right, where it's like you know what's going to happen, but you like the characters and you're invested in the characters. But mm-hmm. I wasn't invested in these characters. Oh, yeah, no. So what's left? They were poos. All of them were just poos. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I guess we kind of are getting to what sort of things we would rather be reading this week. Did you have one in particular or... Yes, I had one this week. Oh, good, because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm usually the one that's like, oh, shit, I forgot we had a, a thing we had to think about and answer at the end of our podcast that we do every two weeks. But <laughs> no, this one, um, if you are interested in a trilogy of books that, well, that this one kind of, I think, borders on YA and adult, to me anyway, but has a has a a mix of both fantasy and science fiction elements. And I won't say much more about how they mix because that might be a little bit of a spoiler, but it's the queen of the tearling series by, I think it's Erica Johnson. I know it's a little bit controversial. I know a lot of people thought, well, not a lot of people. I don't know. I guess it's like kind of half and half. Like some people thought it was really boring, but I got super engrossed in this series and absolutely loved it. Um, About a young girl named Kelsey who is kind of kept away from and hidden for most of her life because she is the uh, next queen of this land called the Tearling. Um, but of course people want to kill her and, uh, and so they have to hide her away, but then she becomes of age and has to learn how to become queen. And it is just, it is very good. I think it does a lot of things that other science fiction fantasy trilogies for young audiences, younger audiences don't do. And I loved it. So read it. <laughs> I thought of one that is loosely related to this one. Uh, and it's it's really not so much related to this one as it is just I really wanted to read this book this week and I couldn't because I was reading this instead. Um, mm-hmm. Well, this and, you know, some school stuff. I'm back in classes right now, guys. Um, <laughs> Huzzah. So one of my favorite YA authors is Holly Black. And mm-hmm. she just had a new book come out. And I oh. honestly have absolutely no clue what it's about but i want to read it so bad but it's called the cruel prince um and i can't recommend it because i haven't read it yet but uh i can recommend most of holly black's other stuff i have not read any holly black before yeah you should check it out tithe it's very um fairy tale inspired sort of stuff sort of not even fairy tale fairy let me start over uh 
<laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, very derivative of mm, Irish Celtic Gaelic sort of mythology sort of situation. Mm-hmm. But the characters are interesting, and even if they're not necessarily like there were there's some of her characters I don't relate to, but I enjoy reading about them. They're not they're not perfect and they're flawed and they're uh, kind of messes, but they're like, they're to me very believable and they're very interesting. So even when I can kind of predict where the Mm -hmm. story is going, it's still a good story to read. Uh, It's not at all sci-fi. It's very fantasy, but Mm -hmm. it's lots of fun. And I would suggest any of her uh, stuff for YA. She has a couple, she has some children's series too. Um, but it's all good, and I would recommend checking it out. So that's my pick for this week that I would have rather read instead of this garbage. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> all right, well, that about wraps it up for this fortnight. So I guess it's my turn. <laughs> I kind of forgot for a second. Yay! I like... Maybe you can be nice to me this fortnight like I was nice with this book, but uh, your smile tells we'll me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I uh, had texted Anna and said I wasn't really sure what I was going to do this week. And I thought Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. (laughs) Yeah. I thought maybe I would cheat and pick one of the books that I have to read for class. But all of the books that I have to read for for classes for the next couple of weeks are nonfiction. So that's not going to work. So my first question to you is, (laughs) have you ever heard of Beatrice Sparks. I don't think so. Okay. I don't know. You might know her better by her pen name, essentially, which is Anonymous, as in Go Ask Alice by Anonymous. Oh my god, what? <laughs> what? Have, do you remember Go Ask Alice from your... Did it, was that a book that you read in your uh, early no, years? No, I never had to read that one. Mm-mm. Okay, do you know what it is? No, I am looking it up on Goodreads right now, though, so I can look knowledgeable on our podcast. That's not the one we're going to read. Okay. Um, But essentially, Go Ask Alice was this book written in the 70s by this woman, Beatrice Sparks, who Mm -hmm. pretended that it was a found diary of a real teenager who got into drugs and her life spiraled out of control and she ended up dying. Oh. That's the premise of this book. And since then, there have been many replicators in this genre of books that are found and were written by teens but weren't really and they're about various dramas uh usually drugs Mm -hmm. sometimes being gay sometimes uh anorexia things like that any sort of Mm -hmm. crisis a teenager might have and they're supposedly written by real teens but of course they're not they're written by you know anonymous anonymous who is gen- at, at least in the case of the ones written by Beatrice Sparks, old Mormon women who want to fear monger about things that Mormons don't like. So Beautiful. we're going to be reading one of the books from Beatrice Sparks herself, which is called <laughs> Annie's Baby, The Diary of Anonymous, A Pregnant Teenager. Oh my God. What? <laughs> so let me read so you the synopsis. I'm so excited for this. No, oh right. my god, I'm so excited for this. Oh, yes. When Annie discovers she's pregnant by her boyfriend, she's devastated. She has never felt so alone. With no one she can talk to, she pours her heart out to her diary, confiding her feelings of panic, self-doubt, and the desperate hope that someday she can turn her life around. She decides she wants to keep her baby and dreams of loving and caring for this little person. But after the baby is born, it's in her diary that she faces the agonizing question. Can she really raise this child on her own? (laughs) Okay, I was reading, I was reading this along with you on Goodreads. And I legit read the last sentence as, can she really raise this child as her own? And I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) But then you read it and I was like, oh, that's a different word. (laughs) Oh man! Oh, this is gonna be awesome. A an this anonymous so good. diary of a pregnant teenager, first published in 1998. Yes, it's gonna be so yeah. insensitive. <laughs> yeah. So wow, that's that's our next book. If you guys want to read along, you certainly can. 
It's only 256 just, pages, so it's not that bad. I just scrolled down just to, like to see what the top reviews were like. And the first one says, recommends it for no one in all caps. <laughs> so it's going to be really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that pretty much wraps it up for this episode. Podcast news, though. Oh, yeah, we meant to do this at the beginning. Yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> but you've probably um, been hearing for the past couple episodes, we've got some new tunage at the front of our <laughs> um, podcast now. It's really awesome, right? Everyone loves it? Yes. Um, that is a uh, thanks to friend of the podcast, Ben Cope. So thank you very much, Ben. We appreciate it. Um, it's we awesome. A, we love it. Yes, it's fantastic. We have a link to his YouTube page in our show notes. Enjoy it. Listen to it. Rock out to it. It's like only a few seconds long, but I've been listening to it on repeat since he emailed it to me. So, <laughs> so yeah, we are very excited about that. So, uh, tweet at us and tell us how much you like the new, uh, <laughs> the new intro. Cause yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can no this is terrible this is bad that was very bad i'm mm-hmm. sorry Let me start that's okay <laughs> um, i hope you hate yourself for it <laughs> i don't know whatever let's wrap it uh, so so you anyway guys, you guys so anyway <laughs> so anyway here's wonderwall <laughs> You're my wonder wall. No, no, I can't sing things because then I know you're going to put it in the stinger at the end of the episode. <laughs> Remind me to stop doing that. <laughs> yep. Uh, tweet yeah. at us. <laughs> Email us. We're out. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Professional podcasting 101. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, <laughs> um, so am I ending this recording? Is that how we're ending it? <laughs> I think I well we have to actually say <laughs> we have to say our thing. Oh, okay, fine. Um you can find <laughs> us on Twitter at <laughs> hate readcast. You can email us, um, hate readcast at gmail. And um if you found us on iTunes, congratulations, because that means we've finally been approved to post on iTunes. But I know, otherwise, right? you... what is the hold up iTunes? I don't know. It's super approve rude. Approve our shit. <laughs> um oh. otherwise, where uh, SoundCloud, I guess, is where you're listening to us, so leave us a like, follow us on there, and um be our best friends. <laughs> Please interact with us. <laughs> In the words of Melissa De La Cruz, she seemed like a cool chick. (laughs) (laughs) This book, which is called Frozen, uh, is about two princesses who one of them has ice powers and one of them doesn't. And the one that has ice power. Yeah. Is that is that not the right Frozen? Did yeah, I, read the I, wrong thing? I think no. That you read the novelization of the Disney movie Frozen, and that was exactly Shit. what I wanted you to read. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that was a very that was a very dumb bit. We uh, got it out of the way. It's fine. <laughs>